if you can sort of just give a you know a brief explanation about what oxalates are yeah of course um am i right in thinking that you've had sally norton on the show previously yeah so your listeners are probably familiar with it but i'll go through the basics just in case there's anyone listening that aren't familiar with it so essentially there's this idea um just to kind of go back this kind of central uh nutritional dogma um which persists in conventional medicine but also in nutritional circles as well and it's particularly common in today's world coming from the um let's say the the mainstream sources or official sources this idea that plants are fundamentally healthy um mm. and they are benign right and that the more plants that you eat the the, the healthier you will become um but there's there's many problems with that kind of theory um and and many nuances but ultimately there's this concept of, of plant toxicity that is often overlooked so uh, in regard to in kind of alternative health circles uh, naturopathic health circles these kinds of things it's well acknowledged that you have something like uh, gluten which can cause problems so gluten uh, protein found in wheat um, that can cause many problems for a variety of people um, in terms of irritating the gut in terms of kind of there's links with autoimmunity so it's well established that the gliadin and the gluten found in the wheat can can cause problems so we know that there are certain plants or certain grains that can exert um detrimental effects on the human body and and of course that's very individual but when you go down that rabbit hole it doesn't really end so so ultimately there are a variety of other toxins ultimately we we have this we have gluten so or gliadin which is part of the lectin family and we also have many different other types of lectins, which are found in a wide variety of kind of foods. Um, but then we also have uh, several other toxins which have the capability to cause the human body problems, especially if the gut is not in a good place. If the gut is kind of if we have underlying intestinal permeability or leaky gut, which your listeners are probably familiar with, then it can render someone a little bit more susceptible to these types of toxins so aside from lectins aside from the other things that we find in grains one of the the primary toxins that we find in plants is called oxalate so oxalate is uh, it's essentially an organic acid it exists in many different plants um and it's exists in higher quantities in certain plants than other plants um and essentially it's theorized by certain kind of plant researchers that it might be a um it might be like a defense mechanism employed by plants um, again, there's this concept that you listeners are probably familiar with, but just in case they're not, this this idea that actually every living organism, and that includes plants, that includes animals and human beings and everything in between kind of thing, um, everything wants to survive, right? And so everything has its own uh, mechanism or its own kind of tools by which it can survive in a kind of treacherous world. And um, and so like animals or human beings, we have legs, we have arms, we can build tools. Um, animals, uh, plants don't have that. Plants can't run away from 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 people or from predators or from herbivores. And so what they will do instead is they can release certain chemicals and they do this. So they're operating on a biochemical front to basically send a signal to whoever or whatever animal is eating that that it's probably not a good idea to do that in a you know for too long because they can cause problems so oxalate is theorized to be one of these potential mechanisms it's essentially i said it was an organic acid but basically what it is it's a chemical which can bind very tightly to certain minerals so mm-hmm. it binds tightly to calcium it binds tightly to magnesium potassium other minerals it's a strong chelator think of it a bit like a magnet and in a plant it can exist in various different forms but what you find is you find uh, when it's bound with calcium it forms these kind of crystals or sharp needle like structures so if you look at an oxalate crystal under a microscope there's various different kinds of structures that it can exist in but essentially it is capable of doing severe mechanical damage to um, an organism which consumes it so if you look if you think of um I mean, some of the plants which contain very high levels of oxalate, particularly spinach. Okay, so spinach is very high. Rhubarb is very high. Um, We have kind of dark chocolate or raw cacao that's extraordinarily high. Certain types of tea, so black tea, green tea. Um, We have other plants, including Swiss chard, including um, sweet potato, including potato, white potato. There's, there's, There's a long list of plants which contain 
the, the this this toxin in 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 varying different degrees um but essentially um there are also some plants which don't contain much of it so it's not saying that all plants have this toxin but we have to kind of distinguish and so the way that this toxin is basically operating in the human body is that when we consume too many of these plants the way it becomes problematic is that we can we 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 absorb this oxalate and we can actually accumulate it so over a long period of time when someone eats a, a diet which is very high in these types of plants say if they're on a traditional kind of ketogenic diet which is heavy in plant foods if they're on a vegan diet or even just like a standard western diet which is high in these foods um, essentially what we find is that actually the body over long periods of time especially if there's a susceptibility if they've got poor gut health if there's various other things going on then essentially the body will accumulate this and what is happening is, is that when we are eating a food containing oxalate we're breaking that down in the gut and all throughout the gi tract depending on the form of the oxalate so you have oxalate uh, soluble oxalate or insoluble oxalate so the soluble forms of oxalate are going to be absorbed right throughout the gi tract all through um you know in in the soft tissues in the mouth through the esophagus in the stomach in the small intestine the large intestine so you're going to get the passage of this crystal or this kind of um yeah, this chemical structure through into into the bloodstream and it travels through the blood. And when it's traveling through the blood um, here, because your minerals, if you recall me saying that it is a chelator, mineral chelator, then because your blood is packed full of minerals and your tissues are packed full of minerals, essentially what's happening is, is that it's forming a, it can form a, if it comes into contact with a certain mineral such as calcium, it can basically precipitate out of the blood into a tissue and form into somewhat of a crystal or a stone. And so oftentimes what happens is, is that these crystals can deposit in the joints or the muscles, or they may deposit in uh, various other organs. They can deposit throughout the vascular system. And when they do, you can essentially think of it <clears throat> in an oversimplified, very kind of oversimplified way is, is if someone basically got a very small shard of glass, kind of stab that in your tissue. And that could be in the vascular system. It could be in the muscle. As I said, it could be many people have it in the thy thyroid gland. There's, there's a couple of studies showing that, you know, uh, I think there was one study in adults over 50 or over 60 showing that up to 80% of, of them actually had significant calcium oxalate deposits in the thyroid gland. Wow. And, and this, so this is, is very common.